and a very warm welcome to you. This is the sixth of seven in the Python level one course. A very warm welcome to you if you're joining us for the first time. There are five other videos that come before this in which I take you step by step through the various components of how to write Python code. My name is Paul and I'll be taking you again through this class. Today we are in week six where we shall be looking at functions. So the last few weeks in week one, we just did a quick overview, understanding why we need to learn programming, how we should learn programming. Week two, we started off then with variables, co-io and um, operators, and we looked at the various ways in which we can write very simple instructions. Then in week three, we looked at containers, we looked at lists, tuples, and then we also looked at exceptions. In week four, we looked at dictionaries and sets, and so how these are powerful containers that allow us to do very um, uh, useful tasks in processing data. And then last week, week five, we covered if, for, and while statements. These are compound statements. Well, today, we shall be covering another compound statement, which is a function or functions. And there are several types of functions. I'm going to talk you through how those are. Okay. So let's get started right from the get-go and uh, we'll see how, how things go. Okay then. So here we are. Um, so we're looking at functions this week and as I said this is, um, uh, we'll be looking at different ways in which functions work. Okay. So let's um, let me just set things up here. I need to pin myself so that I can see what's going on. Okay. Very good. Okay, so let's get started. Let's roll, get rolling. So today we'll be looking at a number of things, but before we begin, I'm gonna just go through um, some of the items from last week. I don't know why this is not showing. Oh, okay, then. okay, I think I need to be confused. There we go. So today we're looking at, we'll start with a recap of week five. And in week five, as I said, we looked at if statements, for statements, and while statements. And there are a number of things that I observed by going through the class work that the, you know, the students submitted. Um, one was the idea of enumerate. Um, enumerate is a very important function that allows you to build a list of tuples with an index for each item in your container. So if you have a list which has got 10 items and you want to iterate over that list, but you also need the index of each item from the list. You have two options without using enumerate. One would be that you iterate over range with the length of the list, and that will give you the indices, and from that you could then get the items from the list. Or you could then, you could just iterate over the list, get each item from the list, and then determine the index or you could have an index outside of your for loop, which you then increment. But enumerate just takes away all that headache for you and it automatically gives you the index plus the item. And it's it's useful way to do it. So you don't have to, as in one of the, one of the uh, submissions, where the student built a dictionary and that's really not necessary. Enumerate works just off, you know, directly. The other thing that I also need to clarify is about why loops? With why loops, the most important thing is you have to have a way of exiting the why loop. Now, there are two ways you could do that. We mentioned this last week. One is if you have a while loop with a condition, well, usually you'll have a condition, but if you have a condition, you want to make sure that at some point it is guaranteed that that condition will change to false because that condition will evaluate to a Boolean, true or false. And it will continue to loop, the while loop will continue to loop as long as the condition evaluates to true. So you have to have within the body, within the suite of the while loop, some statement that guarantees that in the life of that while loop, you're going to turn the condition into false. The other option is where you have an explicit exit. Now, in practice, you could also have an exit. You could consist of exit. But that just means that there's something wrong with the way you've written your code. So I would strongly um, urge you not to use that as a way to exit a loop and to use either a break statement 
or to change the condition so that it evaluates to false. And that brings me to the last point that I just want to recap with regards to foreign while loops. You have break and continue and these allow you to determine how you're going to loop through. Now, loop through whatever it is, whether it's a for loop or a while loop. Now what happens is the whenever you have a break, if you have an else statement on your for or your while, then if you use a break within the suite, then the else will not be touched. If you use a continue, it could be touched. It depends on what's happening and there's no guarantee that it's going to happen. So just these are some of the things that I observed by going through the work of the class. Okay, so now let's look at the material for this class. And in terms of an outline, we're looking at three important things. We're looking at functions. We're going to look at lambdas and we're going to look at two important functions. One is called map and one is called filter. And we'll see how to play around with those. We'll usually use those in the context of using lambdas. So let's get started with functions. Now, as I've said, we've looked at compound statements. We've looked, we started off with a try except in week three. And then we looked at if statements in week five, for statements and while statements all in week five. And then today we're looking at the death, which is used to define a function. Next week we'll be looking at with, which is a context manager, and we use it in the context of files. Now, as far as functions are concerned, why do we need to use functions? Well, I'll give you three good reasons why you need to use functions. Whenever you write code, you'll find that if you're writing a complex analysis, your a, a, a module that has a lot of a lot going on, you might find yourself repeating certain things. And a nice way to make sure that that repetition is, to avoid that repetition, is to encapsulate that block of code, which you would repeat into a function. So it allows you to reuse your code, which is always a good thing. Because once you reuse code, it means that wherever, once you isolate that code, and you, 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 you then use it either to a function or a class or whatever it is, any changes that are made to that benefit all the places where it is used. And that means you can accelerate how fast you get to writing good quality code. So functions help you clean up your code and allow you to make sure that you can reuse certain elements within it. The other important reason why we use functions is so that we can organize our code, make it readable. It's always good to think in terms of making sure that your code is easy to follow. There is such a thing as a human being spending time just understanding the code. Once, once someone understands visually what's going on, then they can easily fix any bugs that they find in the code. So being able to have the code neatly organized is a very good way um, of, of, of facilitating the process of avoiding bugs and cleaning things up and helping it to be understandable. And therefore, functions are able to remove a, a lot of the clutter from your code, make it cleaner. And if you have a layer in your code where you just have a bunch of functions that are being called, it's easy for someone to understand what's happening. They can see that something goes in and it's processed, something comes out and that's passed the next function. So it's sort of like a pipeline. You can build a nice, easy, clear pipeline that is easy to understand. So organization is an important reason why you should write functions. And the third reason, which might seem a bit, a bit abstract right now, is that there are certain advanced features that only make use of functions. You need functions. Um, for example, using, as we shall see, the map and the filter functions require you to provide a function either as an anonymous function or as a named function, but they need a function to work. Other features within the language that need functions are if you want to run multi-processing or multi-threading, where, whereby you're taking advantage of, of multiple processors or you are trying to make your code more responsive, you need to write functions to take advantage of these features. They are built around functions and you can't run away from them. It's just two examples in which you need to use functions. So there are three reasons why you should use functions for you to be able to reuse your code, 
for you to organize, make your code more readable, and to uh, access advanced features within the language. Now, let's look at the structure of a function. Now, if you recall from last week, and we looked at the structure of, the general structure of compound statements, you will notice that there's an extra section that's been added, the pink section at the bottom, we have added a footer. So this is an additional section that's present within the structure of a function. And we'll see what that is. But as we said before, a function as a compound statement will have a header, a suite, and a footer. And the footer has a special role, and we'll see that in a minute. So let's look at what the, what the different parts are. The header will be defined by having a bunch of literals. So you'll have the def keyword, which is a literal. You must provide that literally. And then you provide the name of the function. And then you have to have an open parenthesis, and you'd have a sequence of parameters or arguments. Documentation uses the word parameters, but you should be familiar that the word parameters and arguments are used interchangeably. Then you have to close the parentheses, and then you have to provide a column, otherwise you get a syntax error. There follows a suite which can have any Python. Absolutely anything. It can have other functions, it can have classes, it can have whatever you want inside it. Um, we can we'll provide within that suite. Now, the suite there is called the local scope of the function, as opposed, opposed to the global scope of the module. So you always have two scopes. There is a global scope which is sort of like the root of the module. That's where you define global variables. That's where you define your functions, which will be accessed by, accessed by anything else. That's where you define your classes. Uh, that's where your main function should exist. That's where your if under, under main should exist, uh, under, under name should exist. And then within each compound structure, you shall have a suite, and that suite is a local scope. And we'll see the same thing, exactly the same thing happens when you're working with classes. Classes have a local scope, and the name of the class provides a namespace in which that scope exists. In the case of functions, the functions live in the global namespace, which is actually the module's namespace. This might not make sense right now, but over time you, you begin to understand this, uh, what the idea of a namespace is, is a very important organizing feature. But your key take home from this uh, image here that you have is that you have the header, and then you have the suite, and the suite provides a local local um, uh, a space for local variables. So it's the, the local um, scope. And then at the end, there is an optional return uh, statement. Use a return literal keyword together with a variable that's present within the suite. If you try and provide a variable that is absent, you should have a name error. So that's the general structure of a function. And now let's look at an example. So this is from week one. In week one, we had a module in which we were trying to solve the uh, quadratic equation. And what you have there is the function called calculate. So let's look at this in the in PyCharm. I'm going to switch displays right now so that I can show you how that looks like. Okay, so let's look at this in PyCharm. So we have a function. We're going to we're going to write the function. Let's just write it again so that you can understand what's going on. So we have the death literal, which is a, the required for it to know that that's where we are defining a function, and we have a name calculate. And because we want to solve a quadratic equation. A quadratic equation has three values that I then use to determine the solution, and these values are called the coefficients. And these values are typically called A, B, and C. And what we want to return is the values of x1 and x2. So we are going to have a return of x1 and x2. Now, we haven't defined what x1 and x2 are, uh, we're just doing this right now to have some structure so that we know how does this work. So we have an example of how we expect to use it here. We expect to pass the values of A, B, and C as 1, for example, 2, and 3. If 
But let's make it one to one because that, that we know we can get a solution for that. And we need to calculate the value. So we know if you look at the equation, the equation has got x1. If you look at the videos, video uh, number one and number two, I think. X1 is, we'll calculate, so we have to import some modules where they should automatically import. X1 is equals to, so we'll have minus B uh, plus a math dot and square root, and that should import math automatically. Yeah, that does that. And we'll have a value here which we are going to call the discriminant. Um, and we get the square root of the discriminant, and then we have to divide this by 2 and div divide this by a. Okay, that's one way you could write it. You could write, put it into brackets and say 2 times a. Now we have to find what this discriminant is. This discriminant is equals to b squared minus 4 times a times c. Now, just a little note, you probably have seen me do this. So there are a number of shortcuts that are provided with um, PyCharm. And if you want to clean up your code, the shortcut, if you're using a Mac, is going to be Command Option L. I think on Windows it might be Control, op Control Alt L. So if I do that, it's going to clean up. Just notice it's going to clean up my code. It's a really nice way of, of you know, working very quickly. If you want to duplicate a line, you could duplicate a line with Command D, or in Windows, I think it's Control D, and it just duplicates the whole line. So just some tricks that you can use to make to move faster. So there we have X1 and X2. Now, in this particular case, we haven't taken care of the condition where the discriminant is negative, and we don't want to calculate the square root of a negative number. But let's just for now assume that since the values we are providing will give us positive real roots, we can we we will we'll make do with what we have. So we're going to print. As we did before, x1 is equals to x1, and x2 is equals to x2. So let's just go through over what we've done here, a number of things that we've done. So we've defined our function calculate, and we have told it what the variables that it takes, and we have then done some calculations with these variables. We have used all of them. Notice the variables are just single letters. We don't have anything else appended to them. And these are special. We are going to define what kind of parameters these are. Then we do our calculation for the discriminant. We calculate our value x1 and x2. And then we say return x1 and x2. Notice here we have separated them by a comma. And if you remember from week three, this means that we, this will make a, a tuple. So the return is a tuple. And what we have done here on line 15 is we unpack this tuple. If we just got a value, let's say x, then we pass that to calculate, x would be a tuple. But what we've done here is we have done unpacking. So this is unpacking of a tuple. So those are the main components, the def literal, the name of the function, the parameters. Then we have our suite, and then we have our return value. Now let, let's just spend some time here just thinking about the idea of scope. We talked about local scope, we talked about global scope. Now, the key point to take away from, from this is these variables A, B, and C are only relevant to the, the suite of the function calculate. That's what we mean by a local scope. It means that outside of this function, if we try to print a or B, then they shouldn't exist. That should raise a name error because, and you can even see Python is saying, PyCharm is telling us it's an unresolved reference. Within this function, A exists, that's the local scope, but outside here, we don't have anything. Now, if we write up here, we say A is equals to one, this will resolve this, this error here, but it will not affect what's inside here. Everything that happens inside a function, because it's a local scope, is safe and secure and private. You can call it that. But the, the, the correct term is that it's a local scope. So these variables here, we can reuse them in other functions. We can reuse them elsewhere. But within the function, they are private to that function. There's a way that we can use variables from outside inside the function 
and we'll, we'll see how to do that. But let's just run this. I'm going to get rid of this right now. That's not really important. I just wanted to illustrate the point of... Uh, and again, I do Command-Alt-L, or if you're on Windows, command option l And that cleans up my code, all those scribbles. If you notice at the top right, um, it should have this one-week warning. But typically, if you don't have... I don't know why I have a week warning. That is. That's not important. So let's run this and see what happens. If you run that, it gives us, prints out our solution. So we have invoked. So here we say we are invoking the function. That's the key, word, the key phrase to use, we invoke the function. We passed values here, one, two, and three. And when we passed these values, they took on the value, the, the, the variables inside took on the values that we assigned. That's just an important thing to understand. So from this function, um, this is a bit more detailed because we have a check for the, 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 the sign of the discriminant, whether it is positive or negative, uh, but it's exactly the same idea. Let's look at another example. I'm going to write this one out. We are, going to, we are doing add. We have a function called add, and it does slight, something slightly different. Um, keep on going the wrong direction. So let's write a new function. We're called def add. And this takes a number, and it takes extra. And in, in this case, we've given extra is equal to 5. And what we do is we return. So you can perform the evaluation immediately inside the, the return statement. So that means that here, for x1 and x2, we could just as well have written the full expression of x1 and x2 in the return. That just makes it look messy. And it's neater if you separate them into variables. Now, of course, this is something that it's a matter of taste um, and that that knowledge comes with time. But it's always good to have things nice and clean. Remember, since we're using a local scope, it's not as if we are um, we are using an excess number of variables that we, you know, for example, like we are running out of memory if we use too many variables. It's a local scope and, and, and that really doesn't affect things. So anyway, here we are going to do the calculation immediately on the the return statement and we say number plus extra. And again, I clean things up using command alt, command alt L. And there are several ways we could use this. So one thing I want you to pay attention to here is now we have one of the arguments already has a value. And these are what we call default parameters because they already have a default value. If no value is specified, we use that value. And that's exactly what we have here. So if we run this, um, so suppose we, what do we use here? We're saying bigger one. Okay, so bigger one is equal to add one. We print bigger, bigger one. Let's make it a full statement. Uh, bigger one is equal to bigger one. So that we can actually see. So if we run that now, you see bigger one is 6 because we gave it the value 1. We didn't give it the value of extra. It just used the default value that it had. Now, I am going to... Let's try this one now. Here we have, let's say, call it bigger 2. Bigger 2 is equal to add. And we're going to print the value here. Bigger 2 is equal to bigger 2. Now notice how we have called it here. We haven't used the word extra. We have just passed the value 3. Now, the reason why we're able to get away with that is because we have there's an order in which we should specify our parameters. We have to start with positional parameters, and that's what, whenever you have a parameter that doesn't have a default value, it's called a, a positional parameter. It must be provided... In, in the in the right order and oh yes and there's something I can illustrate here so and then for the value of 3 we, we don't really have to specify that it's associated with the parameter extra but Python will know that this means we are passing it to extra and it's going to do the calculation correctly and if you see it gives us the value of 4 now if we swap things around so let's just make a bigger 3 but this time we swap the values. 
now the order shows us which parameters we are associating with which values. Three will now be associated with number, and one will be associated with extra. So what we expect to get is four. And if we print that out, let's just do this. So we get the value four again because it's exactly the same values. But if we can add an extra line here to, to say what each of the parameters are and what their values are. So if I print number is equals to number and extra, it's another nice tick trick. You could um, use Alt, you could depress Alt when you're typing. You can select multiple things and you can type them together. So extra, so you can have two castles really neat feature. So notice here for bigger three, number is three. So for bigger three, when we call bigger three, number is three, which is the first one here, and extra is one. We get the same result for, but when we said bigger two, where we had one and three, number was one, and extra was three. And the last way we could call this is by being explicit and specifying what extra is. So let's look at that. So now this is bigger four. Bigger four. And this is just, we've already, we've actually already done this, but we'll see exactly the same as we got when we had one and three. So when we had one and three, we had number was one and extra was three. The reason why this is good is it makes it clear. I'm not sure. Can we can we say number is equal to three? Will it give us a problem? No, it doesn't. So here, what we've done is we have we have actually miscommunicated to the the reader of this because we are telling them we have got two keyword arguments, but in reality we don't have two keyword arguments. Python has come up with new syntax to try and enforce to make it strict, and I'm not going to go into the details now. But now it is possible to make sure that positional arguments are not used as keyword arguments. And you can force keyword arguments or default arguments to be def default parameters to be used as default. But if you have a function which has got some positional parameters and some default parameters, I would strongly recommend that always call, always include the full name of the default parameters to make it clear to the user what can be changed and what is optional. Without doing that, then it's, it's hard to know. So this is the right way. I would say this is the, the right way to call this function. That to call add. And while it is possible to do it this way, uh, the way we had said, we had just done it before. So we said bigger five, and we said number is equal to that. I just put here, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. This is confusing because it, it's communicating the wrong thing. And uh, print, uh, let's just, I just copy this in here. Okay, so don't do this. This is just wrong. Also, don't do this. This is, again, it's confusing because you're hiding the fact that one is a default, it's supposed to be a default for the value of extra. Uh, and then don't do this. Um, this is okay. Um, and this is okay. No, 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 this don't do this. So, these ones, the recommended, my strong recommendation is in order for your code to be understandable, do this, okay, this is the right way, don't do this and don't do this. Just make it clear for the user, the reader, to understand what, what you, are, you are doing. So this is a second example. So now that we have looked at two functions, we have an idea of the different parts of the functions. We've been able to call or invoke the function. Let's go through now some of the theoretical ideas. First of all, let's talk about naming the functions. When it comes to naming functions, exactly the same rules as apply to variables. When you are naming your variables, you want your variables to be descriptive. You don't want them to be too long. You want them to be short, maybe two words separated by an underscore. In some cases, you could use camel case, 
But that, I think, is frowned upon, even if some of the Python modules use camel case. But in general, we should try and use small letters and separate words with underscores so that the words are readable. The underscore just stands in for a space. So we're using, what characters do we use? We use small, um, small uh, letters. We use capital letters, so lowercase and uppercase. Underscore to separate words and numbers to, you know, whatever it is you want to use the numbers for. Maybe you're saying this is, you know, change one, change two, change three, for example, uh, to make it clear to the, to, the, to the reader. Since you're writing software, you're, you're writing, and your writing should be clear. You really want to make sure that your, the person who's going to read the code, because the code is not, not just for executing, it's also for working with and improving. You want to make sure the variables are clear. I cannot emphasize this enough. I think I said this in one of um, one of the classes where I, I mentioned uh, right at the beginning, variables, the way you name your variables is so, so important. So just put some effort into that and you'll be very happy with yourself if you do. Now, when it comes to, of course, do not use a numeral to begin the name of a function. Python will just, you know, will stop you in your tracks. But you can't use numerals as the first character in a name. Now, when it comes to how do we name, what, what are the suggestions for the names to use? I would say prefer either a verb, just a single verb that says that what the function does, or use a verb phrase. It should be possible for someone to read the name of the function and read the variables and it reads like a sentence. So if you're calculating, so for example, if you're solving an equation, you'd say solve equation and you have the parameters there. Solve equation and you have, let's say, the names of some of the important uh, para parameters that are needed to solve that. So if it is speed, velocity, and something. Your sentence, the function names should be readable so that if you have a sequence of different functions being called, Someone can immediately see what's going on. Open the file, close the connection, do this. Then it's very straightforward because you're using, using verb phrases. And a, an important suggestion just to keep in mind is if you have a function, make sure the function does only one thing. And by restricting it to do that one thing, that will be reflected in the name. Usually if you find that a function has a very ambiguous name, not very clear what the function does, it's likely that the function is doing too much, and then you end up with very long functions. Functions shouldn't be long. I mean, even if you're doing a lot of complex things, some of the things that would be complex, you can actually remove them as other functions and make it straightforward what the function does. So try and make sure that if the function, whatever the function does, try and restrict it to do just one thing and do that one thing well, and, and, and then that will be reflected in the name. So these ideas, they actually go together. Short verb phrases and doing one thing come in handy. Now, this will later on, when you begin introducing tests to your, your, your code, you will thank yourself for having made sure that the functions are focused in what they do. By having focused functions, you can then test the function individually. You can just test that one thing that the function is doing. And it's so much better, it's so much easier than to add power to your code that way. So that's it for naming functions. So now let's look at what are the parameters. At the beginning, I started talking about global versus local scopes. And parameters within a function will have a local scope. So function parameter of a local scope, however... There is such a thing as the global scope, and let's do let's just do illustrate how that looks like. So for us to understand that, I'm going to define a function, simple function, um, which does something with a variable called a. Okay, so I have a function called def do something. Okay, and this takes a value a, and then what it does with a, I think I have an example somewhere. We might have an example in the in the notes, do we have it? Um, no, I don't have it here. Okay, okay, ah, okay then. You, I think it's an exercise in the in the class. So we have do something, and then we return 
um, we have a so if we if we return a plus 10 for example so this is this is straightforward whatever a is we shall add 10 to it and we shall return the new value so let's let's just see that so we have our do something function it returns a value of a2 and we do something and we give it the value of 3 and if you print the value of a2 let's write that as a statement a2 is equals to a2 okay now if you run that you'll see the value of a2 is 13 we gave it 3 it had a 10 we got 13 fine and dandy now suppose we have a another variable here so I'm going to fold this and just fold this so that we don't have to keep uh, moving over so much. So I'm just going to command dot. We'll hide all that without affecting. Now, suppose we had a global variable called capital A, and we gave it a value of three. Okay. And as we said, there's a separation between the global scope and the local scope. We could say now A is equals to A plus ten. And we return capital A. Okay, let's clean that up. Now we have A, which is three. We have capital A, which is small A plus ten, and we return A. What happens now if we print the value of A two? A two is do something of three. We take three, three. So this value here would be three, and capital A will be then be three plus ten, which is thirteen. And we have global A, which is 3. Will we get 3 or will we get 13? So let's see. If we actually, let's um, do this. Okay. Now, if we run that, so we do see A2 is 13 as before. That's fine. Uh, what's confusing here is we have this is 3. So let's make this 10. So if it was 10... Mm, yeah, would we ret we'll return this value of 10. Mm, okay. So we expect that we shall still return 13 because A here is a private 13. However, what happens if we now add this line, we say global A. Well, now everything changes. If we say global A and we said... So this will still, it will override the value of A. We don't want that. What we want to do is we want to now use the value of A here. Um, okay. This one will have to be a bit messy. Global A and A is equal to, okay, A plus 10. So if we run this now, we'll have our global A will now be 10. We're not using we're not using that anymore. Oh, let's, let's see how to do that. Okay, okay, let, let's revise this. So let's start off with a is equals to one. Uh, one here. Um, okay, sorry about this. Okay, uh, now we now now that makes more sense. A is equals to one, a is equals to capital A plus one. This is our local scope. Since it has allowed local scope, since a is one, whatever value we give here which will be 1 plus whatever A is and return that. So if you start off with A is 3, then A2 will be 3 plus 1, and we should expect to get 4, which is what we get here. However, if we change this, if we get rid of this, and now say that this is global A, we now, instead of using, we are now taking on the value of A that was in the global scope, and now we get 13. The key point here is that what global does is it allows us to continue using a variable within our function. And once we print, so if we looked at, we, we could change this so that when we, so this is global A, global A has been changed. If we print A now at the end here, so if we print what A is here, A will no longer be, what it was before. A has now changed to 13. While if we printed what A here was, A here was 10. 
Oh, sorry, we should call this before. Okay. If we print this, A should be 10. So A, the global A was 10. So this is global A. Um, and then we modified global A by making it have the value within the local scope of the function. And we returned the new value, but we have now permanently changed our global A. The key idea here, the key point to take away from this is even if a function has a local scope, you can then invite variables from the global scope using the global keyword. And that's a key takeaway from that, from that there. So parameters, we have global and local. Within a function, they will be local. You could have a, a, a variable within the global scope and you could pull it into your function using the global keyword. That's a key takeaway there. Okay. Now, let's look at some more examples here of positional parameters. So in this example here, we have a function called f, badly named function, but it's just to illustrate a point, which takes on several parameters, a, b, c, d. We have positional parameters are the parameters a and b, okay? And the default parameters are ones that already have a default value. There are several ways we could call this. If we call this, if we try and call this with F1, we're going to get an error. Let's see what the actual error is. So um, I'm going to define this. I don't have it here. So we have so several. So F, A, B, C, D, 5, 8. Um, yeah. F, A, B, C, D, and these had the value, and we returned some calculation here. Was it A times B, A times C plus B? A times C, is it A times C? A times B. And it's minus A times C, minus A times C. Actually, it doesn't really matter. B times B, it doesn't really matter the calculation. The key point is, so this was eight, and this was five. Let's clean that up. So there's our function F, bad name i just want to make that clear that's a bad name and we have several ways of, so let's try and see x0 is equals to f1 that should fail why does it fail it says we are missing one required positional argument b what it's clever enough to tell us that b is missing so that gives us an error we know that if we try and say b is equals to seven so here we are going straight to b and ignoring a x1 is equals to f, b is equals to 7. Let's comment this out so that we can see this new error. So there should be an error somewhere here. It says it's missing now a. So positional means that their position is significant. Where they are placed is important. So we know that that is wrong. Then we have x2, f3, 7. x2 is equal to f3, 7. We won't see the output of this, but we'll just see that it has run correctly. Let me just hide some of these other things because they are making their cluttering screen. So I'm just going to hide this. I'll just comment. I'll uncomment with them later and then when I push. And I'll fold them all. Okay, so there we go. Okay, so if you, if you run that now, now we have no errors because this is okay. This is good, and it is good because we have not yet, we, have, we, we want to use it using the defaults. So this is okay with defaults. We are exploiting the defaults. Okay. Um, here I've written it's also okay, but it's not because you are communicating that these are keywords and they are not keywords. So we know that will work okay. Let's see what happens. What will happen if we do B7A3? Will that work? So X3 and you notice what we are doing here. We are reversing the order. We know that this should be A and B, but no, we are going to say B and A and we are going to give some value. It doesn't matter what the values are. The key idea here is, can we get away with swapping them even if they're positional arguments? And, and you know, for us to see what's happening there, let's see the value. So we're going to print the value of a. a is equals to a. And print f b is equals to the value of b. Okay. So let's run that. 
Now, what it's telling us here is, and let's compare to what we, we wanted. We wanted it to say B is 8. Now, it has actually done that. The second B as 8 and A as 3. And A, uh, let's hide this one because this one is now confusing us. Just want to see that it's also the last one. So we set B to 8, but we have B as 8. Yes, B is 8. We have set A to 3, is A as 3, and that's correct. But what we have done here is we have abused our positional parameters. We say that they were positional in the way we defined the function, and then we swap them around. So this is misleading. In as much as Python will allow you to do this, remember at the end of the day, we are we're not just trying to write code that runs. We want to write code that can be read and that runs correctly. And, and that's, I, I just, I just keep emphasizing. It's so important. Even if you're not, you don't care about other people reading your code, at least think about your future self. Because there'll be a day when you come and you look at this and you'll say, what was I writing here? You want it to be immediate. Oh, okay, this is what I was writing. So this is misleading. Even if it runs, it is not okay. So don't do this, even if it works. And this is the right way to do it. So that we, it is clear, when you run it, you see that A is 3, B is 7, and that's what we expect. We expect that when we give the parameters in that sequence, there's a reason why we, we, we've given the parameters in that order. Um, so, for example, in the case where we were calculating the solutions to the quadratic equation, it's natural to give them in the order that they would be written. When you write a polynomial, you write a polynomial starting with the, the first, the highest degree component, and so you'd expect to start off with A, unless you're in a world where you're used to starting with the lowest po co component, in which case, then again, to that world, you'll be using a certain convention. Try and stick with conventions. Try and minimize the amount of logical tension that you bring to the readers of your code. So that was just an illustration of the positional parameters. The positional parameters try and stick with the order to be in line with how they are expected within the function. Now let's talk about default parameters. So when it comes to default parameters, we're using exactly the same thing. Look what happens when we say, um, so with default parameters, I'm gonna hide this here. And here I'm gonna say, okay, so x0, and here in this example we said c6, d12. So f c is equal to 6, d is equal to 12. So what's the problem here? Well, this should not run, and it will give us an error because we haven't provided the positional parameters. The positional parameters are required. They are mandatory. The default parameters, since we've already given them a value, they're not mandatory. And when we use them, we want to make it clear that these are options that we are taking advantage of. So that, that will obviously fail. What if we put the positionals later? If we say, we say this is x1, and we put one and two, what happens? Um, so we get an error. And this, it's a syntax error because the positional argument, in this case, we have put them to follow. PyCharm will even highlight them there for you with the squiggle that you should have, the positionals should come first, and then your defaults come last. And this is an example where we have, so if we have x2 is equal to f, 1, 2, and then we specify d is equal to 12. This is good, this is okay. And this is okay because we are making clear we have included our positionals, and we are modifying one of the defaults. So here we are modifying one of the defaults. And we're doing it in a way that it's the user will know, oh, okay then, so I can actually change the value of D. So we run that, that should be fine. So this is okay, this is fine. And the same thing with C, if you wanted to change the value of C. I wouldn't run that. Now, you could, of course, you could say X3 is equal to F1, 2, 3, 4. That's, that will run. Python will stop you from running that but it will stop the reader from understanding the key idea that C and D are default parameters. So don't do this. Don't do this because it's misleading. Even if it will run, it's misleading. Okay. 
So now we've covered the structure of a function, global and local namespace, the global keyword, positional parameters, default parameters, naming, and correct way to make the function calls. So now we are going to switch to lambdas. Now lambdas are different things. Lambdas are functions, but they're called anonymous functions. And they're defined using the keyword lambda. And the way we define them is, so let's look at another example. They have a number of examples here. Now in this case, I'm actually giving them a name and I'm doing that because I'm thinking of using them again and again, but typically they won't be used um, the way they won't be used. They'll be used in the context of a map and a filter or one of those functional tools. So let's let's look at some examples. I comment this out. So we said we use the word lambda, um, lambda, and what you have to provide is the parameters that this lambda will take. So a lambda is actually a function. So x, for example. And then typically there'll only be one statement. I don't think you can provide more than one. We can try and see. So let's, we can actually print and see what a lambda is compared to f. We can print what f is. Notice here, I want to see what is the type of f. Okay, what, what is f? I haven't called f. If I want to call f, I have to use parentheses. But I just want to see what f is. And the same thing, we'll do the same thing for lambda. Let's say it's going to square a number. So it's going to square a number. Okay. Let's run this, see what it shows us. So it shows us both of them are functions. In one case, the function has a name. The function is called f. In the other case, it is not a function. It doesn't have a name. But it is a function which is a on the local namespace of the main function. And it's specifically a lambda doesn't have a name. Now, I could give it a name, and you could see what that name is, but for now, this is all we are seeing. Let's see, can we have more than one statement? So we say x um, squared. Um, so if you did an assignment inside, if you said y is equals to x that, and then we said y um, z, is equals to 2y, okay? What what will happen here? Will this work? So that should fail, and it tells us why. The syntax error, an expression cannot contain assignment. Perhaps you meant a comparison. It can only have one statement. So lambdas can only take one statement. They're just a handy way for you to do things. So. Why do we have... Yeah, so you see what's confusing. Even Python doesn't know what's going on. It doesn't know how to render the print. So let's just take that back to be the simple way it was before. Okay, so you can't perform any assignment in it. It will do an immediate return, which is what it expects. And again, that's what we get. Okay. So this is the same as saying print the type of it. That's what we have there. Um, well, no, it's not really. It's just a function. That's the function, and this is the, the type of f is a function. So let's do like what I've done before. So I'm going to call this square, and I'll assign it to a lambda. x times 2. x squared 2. Okay. And I can print square. Now, you can even notice that PyCharm is already complaining and saying you're not supposed to do assignments. Do not assign, according to pep8, do not assign a lambda expression. Uh, just use, if you want to, to make it a function, just use def. But it's still a function. You see, function main, it's still a lambda. It's not a function. Even if we, we have, now we are misleading. So this is misleading. But I'm only doing this to illustrate how to use, to use them. Or what they actually do. So these are other examples of lambda. You can have multiple arguments. You can take multiple parameters, x, y. You can, you can do different evaluations here. So in this case, this is returning a Boolean value. So it takes a Boolean of a calculation, and then it negates it. Or you could just get the value itself. In this case, we have this macro. I'm calling it a macro. Is even or is of odd. 
So that's how we use lambdas. They're pretty straightforward, nothing fancy about them. And they allow you to only have one expression, which is immediately returned. And you can have multiple parameters. Typically, you shouldn't name them. Um, I'm only doing that because I can't illustrate them outside the context uh, on their own. They're, they are meaningless on their own. Okay, so that's it with, with um, lambdas. Let's now use them within map and filter. So map and filter are important functions. So map takes a function in an iterable. What map does, it's, it's mapping the function to each item in the iterable. And you can have more than one iterable. So let's play around with this and see how this works. So I'm going to hide all this again. So with map, so suppose you have an iterable. So I'm going to use uh, random values here. So I'll say random dot choices. And I have range. Um, one to uh, just 10. I'll get k is equal to, let's say, 15. Let's make a nice healthy number. And so these are runs. Call them runs. We can print what the runs are. So that's our, our random values, okay. Now, suppose you wanted to square these. Well, one way to do it would be to just say square is a new list and for um, R in runs. And we could, there are several ways it could be just, the simplest way would be square dot append and we just get R squared. And we can then print square and that's what it gives us 1 9 81 and so on well, that's fine but a better way would be to use map now to use map as we said it's map and it takes a function so here we would have to have a function now there are two ways it could be a named function or it could be a lambda so let's start by using a lambda because that's what we've just learned we're going to use a lambda that we had up there where we are taking for every x we shall square it and we shall then pass runs. So this is the iterable. So it takes the function and the iterable. And let's see what it returns. So let's call this square map, okay? Mapped. And we print square map. So if we run that, we don't see the values. What we see is a map object. Now the map object is an it's an iterable. We can iterate over it. Unfortunately, once you iterate over it, we exhaust it. We don't want to do that. So let's just cast this to a list and build an actual list. And you see, we get exactly the same result using this. The only benefit here is this is one line. So this is one line using map. While without using map, we have how many lines we got? We have to define what square is. We have the first line of square. And then uh, first line of the for loop, and then we do the append. So three lines actually, um, for us to do that. Another way we could, well, there's a way we could do it using what are called list comprehensions. I won't cover that now, but but the basic idea here is this is how we use map. Now suppose we had, let's try and do something else. We had a function. Let's let's do it with an actual function. So we have a function called. So we had a function here called add. We have an add somewhere. It takes number and extra. Um, well, let's just do a new add. So it's add two. So we define a function called add two, which takes a number, um, number one and number two. And what it does, this is just for us to illustrate using map, it's going to return the sum of number one and number two. Well, let's make it more, ex okay, then let's just, okay, number two. So this is our function, I clean up my code. And so now I'm going to use map, and I'm going to say map. Now let's, we're going to make two, two sequences of numbers. So we're going to say n1 is random, the choices range, And again, let's say k is equals to 15, and n2 is the same. 
what I want to illustrate here is that map takes multiple iterables. So map, our function was add to. We give it the name of the function. We don't give it the invocation of the function. We just give it the name, the name alone. We don't need to, let me just write that here. So map takes the name of the function. Not So this is the name, with, so without parentheses. So add to, and then we give it n1 and n2. As before, this would be a map. So we're going to convert this to a list, and we're going to get n sum. Okay. And now we can print n1. n1. We can print n2. And we can print n sum. So if you run that, we see we have 5, 3, that. So notice that this is just one line. It takes multiple where each of them will then be mapped. It's going to run this function taking one item from each iterable. Suppose we shortened this. Suppose we shorten this artificially. So let's see what happens if... They both have 15 items. What if one had 14? What will happen? So let's just print list map add to n1, n2, and we'll shorten this. So we'll just get and um, we'll use a slice here, we'll get up to minus 3. So we know, because you said minus 3, we'll get rid of the last one, we'll get rid of the second last one, and I think we're getting rid of, we stop at minus 3. Stop and don't include. So I think this will now have a length of, of 13. Either way, what's the, the key point here is that they don't have the same length. Will this run? If you run it, it actually does run, but look what happens. When it, it runs, it will it will stop. When it finds that one of them is shorter, it will then stop running from that point onwards. So that's the effect of using map. Now notice the names of my variables, are, they have squiggles because they're sort of violating some of the best practice. Variables should be in lowercase. That's fine. I mean, I'm just illustrating the point. Okay, so that's it for map. Map takes a function. The function can be a named function or an anonymous function. Let's now look at a, another function. So this is an example I, I, I just illustrated. Now let's look at filter. Now filter does something special. Let's see what filter does. Well, I'll run something and I want you to try and figure out what he's actually doing here. So I have uh, random values again. So I have runs and I have random.choices range. Um, 10, I get k is equals to 15 as before. But now I'm going to do filter, and filter works exactly the same way. It takes a function, either a named or an anonymous function, and it takes an iterable. So let's see what it does. We are going to give it a lambda this time, an x, and we're going to say well, the function, the function that we pass filter must return something that can be evaluated to a bool. So the function must return something that can be evaluated as a bool. That can that um, can be evaluated to a bool. That means we need to have, if it's going to be either true or false. These are explicit bools. None and an integer zero. Uh, so yes, say an integer general integer, um, it could be something which can be evaluated as a bool is also a container. So if it is empty, we use the length as an, the same way we use an integer. So here we have x and we are going to say we are getting values from runs. So we need, what are we getting? We are getting a number from runs. When we take that number, we, we are going to check what is the We'll take that number x, we'll get the remainder when we divide by 2, and let's cast it to a bool. Now, if it is an even number, so 2, 2 modulus 2 is 0, 0 is false. So this means that this lambda will return false, and let's see what it does. So we'll, again, we're going to cast this to a list, otherwise we'll just get, actually, let's see what we get so that we can, so filtered runs is that let's see what if we print filtered runs what what does it 
Let's see what it gives us. It gives us a filter object in the same way that map gave us a map object. We don't want a filter object because it's exhaustible. We can iterate through it. Once we iterate through it, we can't rewind it. So we are going to make that a list so that we can always have the list. Now, let me hide these here so that we can just focus on... I want us to focus on what's going on with this one. Okay, I'll just, I'll just comment all of these. I'll uncomment them when I do the commit. So if you run that, now we see we have, uh, we need to see what the runs are so that we can compare print runs. So that's our, our, our random value, 6, 8, 9, 2, and so on. And look at the values that we get back. So what do you notice about these values? Well, I suppose you notice that they are all now odd. And that's what we expect because if this evaluated to zero, the bool of zero is false. So anything that we have a zero here, which is an even number, will return a false, and filter will then exclude that number. So filter is basically a filter. It allows you to exclude numbers. If you want to get even numbers, then, so now we can, we can rename this. Shift F6 will allow you to change a variable everywhere. We say even runs. And for us to get odd runs, so we're going to have, so odd runs, we just have to negate this, so we say not. So if we now print them, you see that we get, this is our list of random, value, uh, random values. The first time we did it, we filtered and got even. So actually, sorry, this is, sorry, this is wrong. This is, it should be odd runs and this will be even. Sorry for that. Yeah, so the first time we get the odd ones and the second time we get the even ones. And what filter does is it does filtering. And the key idea is whatever, whatever evaluates to true will be included. That's a key idea. If true include. Okay, else exclude. That's what it basically means. The equivalent for this would be, let's, let's write an equivalent using a for loop. So the equivalent would be, so let's say we wanted to get odds. We have a list. For R in runs, if R, if we want to get odds, if R modulus 2 is equal to 1, then we're going to include it. So this is exactly the same as a, as a filter. So odds dot append R. And if we print this, print odds, we see that it has exactly the same value as another one there. And you could do the same thing for even. So this is the equivalent for odds, for filter odds. So you see, it saves us a lot because we just put one line and that's it. Okay, so that's it for filter. That's an example there. In this case, we have used the name, so it's not recommended to do this. But you could, if, especially if you're going to reuse that. You're, you're basically create, creating a macro. So let's do a recap of what we've gone through today. So today we've looked at functions. We've looked at the structure of a function. We've seen how functions have the same structure as, as the other compound statements. And the additional thing was that at the end of a function, we had the return statement. So that was the extra new thing that we added to our functions, the structure of the functions. We saw that the suite is any Python any Python, that means even functions, even classes, absolutely anything can go inside. We saw that there's a distinction between the idea of a global scope and the local scope. Every function has a local scope. You can reuse the names of variables within your local scope. They are completely protected from your global scope, except when you want to extend a variable and use it inside your function, you have to use a global keyword. We saw that as before, naming of variables is very important. You want to make sure that your variables are have a sensible name that conveys what they do. And how do we accomplish this? We accomplish this by either using, making sure that the function just does one thing and does it well, 
and that will be reflected in the name and use a short verb phrase to capture what your function does. Don't do what I've done in some of the examples because the examples are just to illustrate how the functions work. But if you're writing code that you're going to depend on for part of work that you're doing or in a production process, you want to make sure that your code is readable. We also saw the distinction between the two types of parameters, that there are positional parameters whose position is important, and we saw key, um, default parameters. We saw how to call this in the right way. We want to make sure that we are conveying to the user that certain parameters are positional and we have modified the default value. Now we don't want to use the names with it for the position or parameters because that's misleading and can allow us to swap things around. So that's just bad practice. Don't do that. We looked at lambdas, anonymous functions. We saw how we can actually put a um, pseudonym on them, which is really not recommended, but would be useful if you're going to reuse them just the way you do with a macro. Then we looked at how to use the lambdas within a map and filter. We saw that map can take multiple iterables. Um, we saw that we need to pa pass a function as the first variable, the first parameter to the map function, and that this could be either anonymous or a named function. And the same thing applies with filter. With map, we are applying some function to everything. With filter, we are testing to see if each member evaluates to true or passes some test, and then we would filter them into an output um, um, iterable. So that covers everything that we've covered for, for this class. There's only one thing that you need to do, and that is test yourself. There is a, I put a, there is a link there, and if you could type that up, 3-H-I-Y-A-T-B, that will allow you to test whether you've gotten a grasp of the key ideas from this video. So with that, we've come to the end of this video. Next week, we shall be looking at our last class where we shall be looking at files, how to work with files. That's perhaps going to be the most exciting part because now you're no longer just reading input and output from the command line. Now you can take input from a file, you can write out your own files, and you can do all sorts of fancy things. And that's just the beginning of you being able to now do some amazing things with Python. So with that, um, I wish you uh, have a great week, and I'll see you next week. Bye.